Ian, I'll uh, I'll tweet it out. There we go. All right. I'm going to share it now. Yeah. I'll share it on Twitter and I'll uh I'll get you. Yeah, thank you, man. Yeah, I'm just yeah, I'm just waiting out on nothing a phone figure. <laughs> what is your account name again it's uh, uh my twitter yeah it's uh at Real capital R E A L underscore number seven H N A S. Yeah. All right, tweeting it out now, and I am, uh, and you are tagged in it. Thanks. Putting it on my Facebook too. All right, get this going. So on this. And now all we have to do is start recording. <laughs> awesome. Tell me when you're ready. Yeah, I mean, just two seconds to tweet this out. We'll be good. You got it, man. Yeah. All right, ready to go? All right, yes, let me sir. start recording. All right, I want to welcome everyone to the uh the QA wrap-up show for the Cold War series with Thomas 777. How are you doing, Thomas? I'm very well, thanks. And yeah, thanks for accommodating this format. Like I said, it just seems to make sense. Um and I, I know that a lot of the subscribers have been eager to, you know, ask questions and stuff and, and kind of get a more discussion based format going. So, yeah, that's great, man. Can and, I can I start yeah, with a question from me? Yeah, of course. All right, cool. Um, we talked about this in the Yaki Spengler episode I did, but a lot of people who have j just start hearing about Yaki hear that Yaki was uh you know, after World War Two, and especially, you know, from after 1950 ish, he took the side of the Soviet Union over America. Can you explain why he would do that? I mean, in geostrategic terms, it it's the perennial principle that the only way that Europe is truly going to be an autonomous actor um, the only way it's going to be able to compete as a superpower is if some sort of concord is accomplished with Russia. Um, you know, this, uh, some people suggest that this is like a, a Kinder's world island hypothesis. I mean, it is and it isn't. Um, it's not, uh, it's not as, so much a geography as a destiny calculus. Um, it, uh, it has, it has to do with power potential, um, not just of material resources, but, you know, of, uh, of mentioned material, as, you know, the Germans used to refer to, you know, um, the human population. It's not just in terms of their biology, but in terms of their capacity to bear culture and things like that. 
um europe as this kind of rump peninsula um you know forever on an enemy footing with russia um artificially instigated and maintained by the united states is never even if the united states withdrew its forces in being from europe but that status quo remained um europe would never ever be able to you know emerge again as, as as a true power political actor of any of any significance in hard power terms i mean obviously in economic terms and in cultural terms you know europe europe is always you know the kind of the center of the world okay in in in, in many respects but um so there's that part of it secondly yaki not incorrectly um he identified uh what the cold war is basically an in-house controversy in ideological terms you know it was the the new dealer alliance with moscow wasn't just a sort of alliance of convenience because europe was in and the third reich was just so evil like on its face that doesn't make any sense you know um what this was is it was uh competing viewpoints of a global socialist order you know one being the new dealer perspective the other being the marxist leninist perspective um colluding in order to, to annihilate fascism and any competing iteration of political order that would uh you know come to dominate the 20th century and and all centuries subsequent so um you know what what one was not superior to the other you know it's not like america represented the west contrary you know the the alien soviet union or, or the socialist soviet union um and America in a lot of ways is more insidious because it had an ability to insinuate itself into European cultural life, um, you know, amidst the occupation regime, I mean, in a way that the Soviets just were not able to. Um, and finally, there was just a difference, uh, there, there, was, there was a divergence of intent. The Soviet Union wasn't trying to socially engineer, you know, white Europe out of existence. You know, I mean, yeah, Marxist Leninism was a horrible system. It was brutal. It persecuted people. It was hostile to religion. It was it, uh, it 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 persecuted people who were who were deemed politically unreliable. It was anti-human. Um, I'm not acquitting that at all. But again, um, it didn't aim to tear out the root of cultural life and carry out uh, a programmatic genocide, quite literally, you know, by annihilating. Uh, by annihilating European culture at the root. And that's exactly what America aimed to do. And in more concrete terms and in more crude terms, not crude in terms of, you know, disreputable or something, but just in, in, in kind of more basic terms also, you know, Yaki pointed to the, the Prague trials, uh, or the Prague trial relating to the, what came to be known as the doctor's plot, you know, um, where these 12, um, these 12 medical people were, were tried for treason and conspiring against, uh, you know, the Communist Party uh, in Czechoslovakia. And 11 of 12 of these people were Jews. Okay, a lot of them were involved with Zionism. You know, they, it, it was obviously the Warsaw, what was to become the Warsaw Pact, the East Bloc. It was obviously them purging, you know, the Jewish element from their leadership caste. And they weren't doing it on some quote unquote racial basis or, or some kind of sectarian basis. And their alibi was, well, you know, it's, it's incidental that these people are Jewish. You know, we, we can't abide this kind of counter-revolutionary act, treasonous activity. You know, it, it, it doesn't matter if, you know, it, it, it hurts people's feelings that, you know, there's certain, certain ethnic groups are concentrated in the ranks of these, of these undesirable elements. You know, we're, we're going we're gonna to realize, you know, justice no matter what. But it was obviously, you know, an, a deliberate effort to purge Jewish influences from um, from the ranks of the of, of, of cadres in, in in the Eastern Bloc. So, if your notion is that, you know, as Yaki's was, um, you know, that, that Europe has to be liberated um, from enemy influences um, if it's going to survive let alone thrive. And if your idea is that, you know, the traditional enemy of the West is, uh, you know, is, is, is the Jewish diaspora and, um, that, that diaspora is, is the, their world of social existence, 
um, is the progenitor of, uh, you know, the most, the, the, the ideological tendencies most inimical to Western survival. Um, and finally, again, if, if you view Europe's path to salvation in power political terms as, you know, a, a concord with Moscow, I mean, all those things, you know, all, all roads lead to Moscow, if you'll allow the metaphor. I mean, that was Yaki's perspective, you know, the, and that's basically shouldn't be controversial. I mean, it, the reason why the Soviet Union was dangerous, the reason why it was insidious wasn't because it was, it was going around doing the kinds of things that like the American government does today. You know, it's not, it, it wasn't trying to, it wasn't going around declaring that like gender doesn't exist or that, you know, you, everybody needs to breed, you know, them, everybody needs to breed into like one kind of like non-race and, you know, you know, all, all, all kind of historical existences need to be eradicated, you know, so that some kind of like equity can be achieved or like nobody has a historical memory. So we're all the same. Like that would, that would never occur to the Soviet Union. OK, um, that doesn't make them good guys, but it makes them far, far less dangerous to, uh, you know, racial survival and and, and kind of human culture in any, in any form than um <clears throat> that America wasn't is, you know, and I, I emphasize to people that what, what, what the American regime does today, this isn't something of like recent vintage, you know, it's not like, it's not like the U S government was like doing good things or wasn't insane until like 1990 or something, or until like 2016, like they've always been, I mean, the new deal regime from inception, it was totally insane. It had totally insane ideas. It, it was always sexually perverted. It, it always, it always wanted to eradicate, people's understanding of themselves as as cultural um um you know as culturally situated like it it uh it, it literally plotted to genocide europe and you know and drafted up entire treaties is i mean you know, like the sexual habits of germans and how we can work you utilize this to to undermine their potential to breed i mean like this really really sick stuff you know, and I mean, some people can't accept that. I mean, whatever. Okay. If people have some like vestigial attachment to, to America, like as a government, I, 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 I don't care, but they're, they're not people I have any common cause with. And I think they're incredibly deluded if they insist on retaining that sensibility while also insisting that they're somehow right wing or opposed to what is going on. Yeah. It's when somebody will bring up, like, um, you'll talk about El Duce and somebody will post the picture of him hanging upside down. And this person is like somebody who's like pro America pro, you know, would, would seemingly be on our side. I remind them that the people who did that to him are the people who are ruling over you today. They're the, they're the same people. And you're, you're just basically cheering on the people who. Well, are, yeah. <laughs> it, yeah. It wasn't a bunch of guys. It wasn't like a bunch of like good old Southern guys who were like, we don't like Mussolini because he's a socialist and he's not keen to the second amendment. Like they were like, yeah, they were like out and out communists and not just out and out communists, but you know, of the kind of, the kind of Adorno and Gramsci type who were, you know, very much quote cultural Marxists. I find that to be a troubling term. I, I don't like it, but um, just for the sake of coherence, you know, that that's, that's like the vernacular, but yeah, I don't, I don't, um, yeah, I don't understand how, I mean, like, it's like, even, even if, even if you've got no affinity for, you know, kind of like European ideological tendencies, or even if, you know, you, you don't like national socialism or, 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 or fascism, like, even if you don't like any of this stuff, like, why, why would you celebrate its destruction? Like, why would you celebrate like Europe being literally annihilated by, by uh by communists and by these like crazy new dealers want to like eradicate the concept of race from this planet and 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 view like man as some kind of like instrumentality to serve like good government i mean that's completely perverted but like i said i think it's there there really is uh like a bougie kind of fixation not like really an obsession with like respectability and there is people, they want to like purge them. People who, people are like ambitious in the wrong ways. They want to like purge their own minds of like unclean thoughts and, 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 and not hating fascism is an unclean thought. So they, they try and cope by saying like, yeah, like I hate the regime, but you know, I hate, I hate Adolf Hitler even more. And, and, and that's the worst thing ever. Like, I, I mean, I don't know. I try, I, I think I'm, I, I think I'm somewhat 
empathetic in terms that I I'm pretty good at putting myself in the position of other people. I mean, just in in like practical terms. I mean, that's there's a heavily psychological aspect to political life, you know. Um, and um, so I'm 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 not saying I, I've got like great insights or something, but I, I have thought about this a lot, and I believe what I just indicated is like the source of a lot of that foolishness. Um, I got another I got another question that was submitted Um, before I do that. If anybody is watching on YouTube and they want to go up to the pinned comment that connects you to entropy and you can do super chats there. All right. Um, Someone asked uh, you mentioned a couple of times, but didn't get into it. Can you do a quick overview of the Red Army faction? Yeah, the Red Army faction or the Bader Meinhof um, gang. They uh. They were kind of unique because they were emergent in night like in 1968. I mean, a lot of things happened of a revolutionary nature, including uh, splintering within the socialist camp. You know, that's when we talk about cultural Marxism, that's really within the Euro communist and and socially radical element kind of split off from Orthodox Marxist Leninism. Well, the Bader Meinhof faction, they kind of had one foot in both camps. And as it turned out, they were very much cl- a client uh, actor of uh, the Stasi, the East German Minister- Ministry for State Security. And they were, they were very much kind of like the brainchild of Marcus Wolf, who was uh, an incredibly dangerous individual. And he was the best uh, intelligence man that Warsaw Pact had, in my opinion. Um, in, um, he was the best intelligence man and the best intelligence organization, probably fielded by anybody in the Cold War. But the Bader Meinhof faction, um, they uh, their their notion was to basically render the Bundesrepublik Republic ungovernable through terrorist activity. Um, you know, just in kind of conventional the kind of conventional terms that that Nazi actors under arms, especially during the Cold War, like going to the unique paradigm they're in, like proceeded. But they also that was during the period when uh you know Willy Brandt. Was uh was seeking genuine reconciliation with East Germany, um, and uh, the idea was uh, it, it, it was it was it was it was very layered, okay? Because on the one hand, uh, on the one hand, it, the idea was very simply like strike a blow against you know like America and the and the uh, and the Bundeswehr um, and, uh, and 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 sympathetic forces you know within uh, the Federal Republic. But secondly, it also gave people like Brandt, like an alibi, like, see, these are extremists. You know, we have, we're nothing like them. You know, we want a rapprochement with the DDR and the Soviet Union for peace. So this kind of thing will no longer be happening, like, which is really kind of br- brilliant. But they, um, they were very effective and they, uh, they had, um, they had substantial contacts with the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, General Command, um, they, uh, I think they probably were, uh, I, I think they probably had contacts with the provisional IRA, although some people, de- I mean, that's debatable. And I don't want to, I don't want to start some sort of argument with people who have those kinds of sympathies, but, um, that was basically the Red Army faction and they folded their flag um, like officially in 1990. I mean, which, which goes to show, and, and people acted like this was strange at the time, but I mean, the epoch, it, 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 it should have made sense that it's like, well, I mean, these, this, this isn't some fake organization. I mean, they had, they did have grassroots support, especially among, you know, the student population and, and younger people, but they very much were like at, at operational t- terms, they were very much like an organ of the Stasi and Horst Mahler, interestingly, uh, he wasn't a, a direct action um, element within the Bader Meinhof gang, but he was a lawyer who worked closely with them he became he ended up going to prison for quote holocaust denial and quote promoting racial hatred you know a few years back and because like immediately after uh the wall came down like he he took up with the the npd you know which is the legacy party of the socialist party um so i mean there you go and like people like der spiegel which says incredibly stupid things with alarming regularity they were like, see, this man's insane. He was a communist and now he's anti-Semitic. But it's like anybody with like a fucking brain, like is like we just like explicated about, 
you know, uh, why a pro-Soviet disposition is what any, like, you know, quote-unquote neo-fascist would basically, you know, be be disposed to. I mean, that's, um, and I, that, that's, I mean, that, that, it's just like the case in point. I mean, it shouldn't surprise anybody, but I, they, they were interesting, they were an interesting case and an interesting element, um, within the Cold War, but that's, a good film about him called the Bottomov Complex. I highly recommend it. It's got Bruno Ganz in it. Or Bruno Ganz. He's the guy who played Adolf Hitler in in uh, Der Untergang. Mm. All right, uh, Muzio Savola over here, five dollars super chat. What does Thomas think of Stalin's War by McMeekin? Have you read it? Yeah, it's it's shot full of data, um, and that data is well sourced. Other than that, uh, I. It's it's typical court history um, that was written in deliberate uh, hostile dialogue with uh, with Suvorov and Joachim Hoffman, and it came out at the same time as Hoffman's book Memory Serves. Um, you know, it's just the the, the implication obviously that somehow the Soviet Union created the world's first like truly modern like warfare state. It created like the mightiest war machine the world has ever seen arguably will ever see yet this was exclusively for peaceful purposes or for no reason you know when the germans attacked for no reason because they're evil i mean that's i mean that i maybe it's just me becoming cantankerous and old but i think it's just me becoming a more rigorous and discriminating histo historical writer and researcher um anybody who accepts that conceptual narrative is it, it taints the entire rest of their research even if they're facts and their data like the raw data is good and worthwhile so there's nothing wrong with citing those kinds of sources and i'm sure people who dislike me or dislike the kinds of things i write will turn around and say like well you know you're just you're abolishing the fake value distinction in your own way and you know you're, you're reducing history to polemic no i'm not but you, you don't have to be like pro-fascist or anything to accept that the soviet union was what i just said it was the first fully realized warfare state that was totally mobilized for war. It was animated by a doctrine of revolutionary warfare and exporting revolution. Um, and it was the single most uh, powerful military actor on the world stage on the eve of Barbarossa. And this is the only way to understand the Second World War. That was, that was the catalyst, you know, um, and as any military type will tell you, um, capabilities, let alone forces and being, are, not, are never benign. You know, they only have one purpose, and that is to wage war. And the capability to wage, the capability to wage war equates to power in uh, its most distilled sense. And um, power is the currency of politics. It's the only currency politics everything else is addressing um so a state that is mobilized to such a degree as the soviet union was not only is it never truly benign it is actually the precise opposite so jmr cowboy asked uh was that the same red army wrangles white army fought against or a different one what we're talking about the red army faction that's what i'll, I'll wait and see but i'm okay, gonna take yeah. a, i'll, I'll I take a question, question. I'll take a question off of uh, off of Twitter from under your your post. He said, um, "Someone would like to hear mention of, of um, a, a James Gregor brought up in Faces of Janus um, the possibility that instead of Gorbachev, the USSR would end up with a version of what basically could be called Russian fascism." Yeah, I don't accept that, and um, Russia's conceptual pole stars are totally different. That's why I try to explain to people when Moscow talks about, you know, when, when Moscow calls its enemies Nazis, I mean, first of all, Ukrainians are, are idiots. So, I mean, they, they, they they'll, they'll run around like slaughtering Slavs on the order of some like crazy Jew and claim they're doing it like for the white race or something. Cause they're, they're fucking crazy and they're morons. But uh, beyond that, the, uh, the, the Russians lost 30 million people fighting the third Reich. So like they 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 call people Nazis and fascists as like a stand-in for enemy. It's not because like they're they're pink-haired fat girls who are into like lesbianism. It's not because they're it's not it's not because they're like a bunch of crazy Jewish people. It's not 
It, it's not because, you know, they, they listen to dead Kennedy's records. Like it makes conceptual sense. Um, the way a, a kind of a kind of nationalist authoritarian Russia that would definitely be possible, um, but it wouldn't it it, it wouldn't look like it, it would it wouldn't look like Mussolini's Italy did you know transpose the 21st century and it wouldn't even look like uh, it wouldn't even look like the, the you know the Syrian bath rule in Syria like it'd be like weirdly Russian its optics would even if only superficially be very much bound up with Orthodox Christianity. Um, the, uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the military would have disproportionate clout, you know, more than like, you know, the political cast, which would kind of like neutralize any like truly political projects of an, of an ongoing nature. You know, like it'd be, it, it'd be kind of like, it, it'd be kind of like 10 miles wide and like one inch thick. Okay. Like it's not to say it'd be like a weak state, but I'm talking in terms of like an ideological catalyst. There's like wouldn't be much there. Okay, I think Russia is frankly. I, th I think when Putin goes, either because he he dies or or he, he actually finds a successor that United Russia can live with, that's probably what you're going to have. Okay, but it's not it's not going to be it's not going to be fascistic in any meaningful way, and it's not it's not going to be some weird like Eurasianism like Alexander Dugan like fantasizes about. Like that's just not that would have no currency, you know. And um, and for something like that to take off, the former Soviet republics in Central Asia, like the stands to be kind of colloquial and like dumb about it, like they'd have to be looking to Moscow for their cues, like culturally, politically, and 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 strategically. And they're like not doing that at all, you know. Like Eurasianism doesn't have any legs, you know. Like it's like something cool that Russians like to talk about, and that it's like, it's a thought experiment. It's certainly like not impossible, but that the Eurasian moment was the Soviet Union, okay? And like that's gone. It's not ever coming back. Here's a another question from Twitter. Um, how brutal was Soviet occupation of Eastern Europe? It always seemed to me that Stalin's crimes from the post-war era get brushed over by mainstream historians. No, that's a great question. And yeah, I saw that on my timeline earlier this morning and it, it stuck in my mind. Um, the the true true Soviet brutality, true communist brutality in the Soviet Union as well as in the states that emulated the Soviet Union reached its zenith in the revolutionary phase. Uh, the Soviet Union exterminated around 10 million people before a shot was fired in the Second World War. You know, the, these were political unreliables. These were ethnic groups that that the regime didn't like. You know, these were people who, uh, as Kevin McDonald exhaustively researched and pointed out in his paper, Stalin's Willing Executioners, um, which was very cleverly returning a serve to Goldhagen. You know, when you, something like 70% of, uh, of the NKVD, like direct action element was Jewish during like the, 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 the height of the revolutionary phase. And these people were just like suddenly accounts of like people they didn't like, you know, whether they were kulaks, whether they were like, you know, Belarusians, whether, you know, they, they were people who, you know, uh, a lot of radicalized, very, very vicious, you know, um, Jewish people under arms didn't like. I mean, this was um, what it was, what, it, it, it was neither it was neither truly organized, nor was it truly scattershot. But that's that's really where the bodies got stacked up. And there really was a, a, there, there truly was as Robert Conquest um documented you know a soviet death camp system i'm not being colloquial or using you know hysterical language or something the really brutal aspects um kind of programmatic aspects after the day of defeat in 1945 um the uh the the uh the american authorities were just as bad you know they uh they starved out millions of germans like was endemic you know um and 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 if not encouraged you know like just just tolerated more than tacitly you know the the morgan Thou plan in a sense very much was implemented although not realized to its full extent as envisioned owing to a strategic situation but um i'd say back to your question and the kind of four corners of it the uh the forced population transfers the the literal ethnic cleansing Germans, you know, of millions of German people from lands that they had occupied in some cases for a thousand years. Um, 
that was very much something Washington encouraged in some ways, participated in the planning of directly. But operationally, it was the Soviet army and 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 police who made that happen. Um, my opinion is that's the most uh, kind of that's kind of the most like that's the strongest example of like naked brutality. And I mean, people will come back and say like, well, you know, the the Germans were ethnically cleansing, um, you know, uh, the Soviet Union and they were, but it was a race war. OK, and there's a difference between that sort of activity underway, terrible as it is, incident to a total war and, you know, just perpetuating a programmatic campaign of ethnic violence after cessation of hostilities. You know, there's I, I don't really think that the latter can be justified um, in any absolute sense. And it's it's not it, it's it only really what about is um, oh, but the Germans did bad things as any place. And also, finally, and I, I know nobody asked, but I'm going to see what my own take anyway. You know, if you're a man of the West, um, and if you're pro white um, and if you want your race to survive, even if, even if even if the Third Reich was literally the most evil regime that ever existed, you don't you, you don't you don't cheer on the ethnic cleansing of your own people. I mean, this is this is a uh, brass tax stuff, you know, and um, one doesn't need to be some sort of died noble Machiavellian to understand. Aside from that, that uh, you know, politics, power politics does take place somewhere beyond beyond good and evil. If you'll allow the overused, um, you know, kind of, kind of um, reference. So um, we got a question here. Um, what was the deal with the Rosenbergs? You said you'd talk about them in one episode, but never got around to it. Oh, I totally forgot about that. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, we can. Um, I've thought about having like just a, a dedicated like atomic age episode, you know, like beginning with um, the proliferation of the bomb in 1949, 48, 49, you know, going through the the early Cold War and um, the new look and, and you know, kind of when 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 every everybody in the national security apparatus had like, you know, atomic weapons on the brain, like through, you know, detente and then finally SDI. The Rosenbergs are basically what they appeared to be. Um, I think uh, I certainly don't. I, they certainly should have been executed. Um, I think uh, at least Julius Rosenberg. I think Ethel Rosenberg wasn't like I'm not. I'm not saying she was just like a stupid woman or something. There's plenty of women, who, particularly in radical politics, who were, were very smart and very dangerous. I think Ethel Rosenberg was not one of those. I think she was kind of along for the ride. Okay, that doesn't excuse her, her whole liability, but. Julius Rosenberg, he was kind of like an orthodox, like Jewish radical, um, not orthodox Jewish. I mean, like an orthodox radical who was Jewish. Okay, But he, I think, um, I think in some ways, though, his, from what, by, from his own testimony, um, just to his own intimates, not under oath or anything, I believe his notion was somewhat like that of Chris Boyce, the guy who's the subject of the Falcon and the Snowman, mm -hmm. although Boyce obviously is a far more sympathetic character. I believe aside from Rosenberg's own kind of socialist leanings, he believed that in order for stability to reign, you know, the burgeoning kind of bipolar system and prevent, uh, you know, the onset of another round of, 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 of just massive, you know, um, interstate violence, there would have to be, you know, uh, a, a true balance of forces between the superpowers. And that could only be achieved if, if uh if moscow had the bomb you know and again like i said like i he didn't say this in open court or something or you know he didn't he didn't raise this to the judge you know in the hopes that he'd be spared the gallows these are the kinds of things he said to like his friends you know like reading between the lines um that was why the rosenberg became these kinds of why the Rosenbergs became these people who are held out by the usual suspects as see this this horrible anti-Semitic lynching of these people. That's incredibly weird because they're about the least sympathetic defendants I can think of. Um, 
but that's there's like not really anything there. I mean, it's like Leo Frank, like like Leo Frank was uh, Leo Leo Frank was a child molester and a murderer, but like you're supposed to feel bad that he got lynched because apparently it was like terrible that this guy who like victimized little kids got lynched. Like I don't <laughs> I don't I don't quite understand that, but it's something. Uh, it, it goes to something that kind of like moral bankruptcy of the of the people who who come to the defense of these of these personages in history. Like I'm not I'm not saying that like lynching is good in the case of Frank. I mean I I believe in due process in a real sense, but I I also don't feel bad if child molesters and people who harm children get killed. Okay, and anybody who makes it out like this is some terrible, you know, terrible instance of a uh, of of a uh, of rough justice. I mean I, I'm not I'm not and I'm not comparing selling nuclear secrets to molesting kids at all. Like they have nothing at all in common. Okay, and um. I can easily see myself like passing <laughs> nuclear secrets, not to Ivan, but uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm the last man who's gonna sit here and, and and act like fucking prissy about such things. But um, you know, if there's in the modern era, there's really no clearer case of high treason than what the Rosenberg did, and what the Rosenbergs did, except maybe for the Cambridge Five, it's just in terms of the sheer kind of like gravity of a. Uh, of, of their ongoing espionage but yeah there you go um i realized that was long-winded but the short answer is like there's there's nothing there it's exactly what it appears to be you're supposed to feel bad for jewish communists for some reason because you know any any time they face consequences it's because of mean anti-semitism or something right i just want to remind people that in the pinned comment in the chat there you can do super chats over on entropy but let's get another question from twitter um, in one episode, you mentioned the Marine Corps and Air Force were able to adapt to Vietnam, but not the Army. Can you elaborate? Sure. That's a great question. The Air Force was interesting, and it was very dynamic in that era. We'll start with the Air Force first, okay? Um, they became an independent service branch. People like Billy Mitchell, even before you know the Second World War, pushed for that. Because uh, there was an understanding that, you know, army thinking had become kind of stagnant, okay? And also, it just, the army was not particularly comfortable with with with, with new technology. They, they just weren't. That's not a political take. That's a fact. But it's also, too, it was like the, the science of aviation, and particularly military aviation, it was something everybody was learning by doing. You know, like when Curtis LeMay first started flying, in you know in the inner warriors uh that's when pilots were still like flying by like visual sight of like you know terrestrial land features and things you know and trying to match it up to like a paper map okay now the air force obviously by uh by the time Viet by, by the time the, the the real escalation got underway in vietnam in 65 um the uh there was um uh, you know, the Air Force, uh, they'd been, their bread and butter was strategic air command. And that also is what they owed, not just their lobbying power to, but uh, also their kind of preeminent position in, um, in the, uh, in the kind of American defense establishment structure. They were able to pretty rapidly repurpose to a conventional role, but a conventional role that um, was uh, was difficult to realize. You know, these Arclight bombers, these B-52s, um, those were uh, those were purpose. Those were those were those were purpose to attack with nuclear weapons. OK, in a strategic capacity. Um switching them to a conventional repurposing them to a conventional role um you know in a, in a conflict like vietnam where frankly until uh you know 1972 you didn't even really have like true combined arms set piece battles where they could really kind of shine um the fact that they were able to you know kind of wreak so much havoc on uh the ability of the north vietnamese to not just reconstitute forces but you know, to uh, to sustain infrastructure, not just command and control, but you know, any any and all kind of basic infrastructure relating to the war effort. That's pretty remarkable. And um, it's also the uh, 
Um, it was more more naval aviators, but some Air Force aviators too. They got engaged over the battle space um, tactically, and uh, Vietnamese pilots are pretty good. And there obviously were Soviet pilots like flying sorties too. That's what brought dog fighting back. You know that that's the whole reason why why uh, why um you know tactical air command like uh you know got got a, a boom and that's why uh and that's why in the naval side like you know top gun got created in the first place that's what i meant about the air force in the case of the marine corps the marines they were used to doing more with less just because of the nature of their missions and deployments you know the small wars manual um was uh was written by uh you know officers and ncos who'd been fighting in nicaragua like in the 20s and things um the marines better understood how to like you know the, the need for you know kind of like in the field diplomacy with indigenous elements like stuff like that and the um the u.s army you know after world war ii it was just like singularly obsessed with firepower you know and um like look what they did in vietnam it's like uh you know let's let's show up as heavy as possible let's have guys wearing fatigues that we'd have them wearing in the inner german border you know like carrying around like rations and metal cans you know, uh, and toting like 60 pounds worth of gear on their back in like 110 degree tropical heat. Like that's not, I mean, that, that's the whole thing's absurd. Like Army Special Forces totally shined, you know, but that's, but this was before like SOCOM was like, was like bros with like goofy beards and sleeve tats who like think that they're the police or something. Like this was when like these guys were like genuine weirdos who were like kind of like their own branch of the military and um they were really they were really up on some progressive and dynamic like tactical doctrines um that's what i meant and i think that the 1960s army was actually pretty squared away okay they were very very well suited to fight warsaw pact but they were not they just lacked like operational flexibility in the with the, in in a way that was needed but it's just i mean the us army the U.S. Army had a hell of a time in the in the Far East. One of the reasons I like the movie, The Thin Red Line, like nobody likes that movie, but I think it's a dope movie. Not just like, I love Terrence Malick, but it's about the U.S. Army in the Pacific, and like nobody thinks about that. And you know, it's all about the Marines and the Navy, and I mean, which then that's where like a lot of naval and Marine Corps legends were made. But the U.S. Army in the Pacific was fubar, and like uh, like in all kinds of ways. Not just because it was viewed as the secondary theater, but it's just because like the army was fucked up, like fighting in Asia. You know, like, and they were, it's, they, they, they were not ex like at the command level. I'm not talking about, you know, the guys in the field, like doing, you know, I'm not talking about the actual infantry men who were game as fuck, but like the guys making operational decisions, it's like, they didn't, it like, didn't compute that, you know, this was not, we're not, we're not, we're not, we're not fighting Verdun or Bella Wood, you know, just with, against, the, against the Japs, you know, it's not all the same. You know, that's what I meant, but I'm not, I'm not a military man. So, I mean, look at me, obviously, okay, but I, I'm sure that military types will say I don't know what the hell I'm talking about, but I, I, I mean, whatever, okay. I mean, that's that's my position. I think I can back it up. So uh, over here on YouTube, uh, Viva Cristo Rey is uh, he has a comment and then a question. It says yeah. I saw a B, I saw a B1 Lancer flying low over Chicago the other day. Thought Red Dawn was happening, but it was just yeah. opening. It was just opening day for the Cubs. <laughs> no, they're they're uh that that aircraft, as you know, I mean that was meant uh that was that was that was meant to to go in low, go in fast, uh, and strike super hard in targets and <laughs> in the Soviet Union with nuclear weapons. It was a uh, it was a bad bitch. I mean, the B-2 was the B-2. It was a, its immediate successor. It was a B-1 on steroids with stealth capability. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a fascinating aircraft. And I, the, Ivan's answer to that was the backfire, or what NATO called the backfire. It was, uh, its actual name was the Tupolev something. But yeah, no, that's, you see, uh, you, you see some, uh, you see some cool aircraft over, uh, over Chicago, man. So his question was, why was the Soviet Union and company so hostile to Freemasonry? And why was this sentiment shared with their right Hegelian enemies? I'm not an expert on Freemasonry at all. Um, what I do know about it 
is that uh, people on the right always hated Freemasonry. And, like in America, Freemasonry like is nothing. I know some people in the Congress are going to be like, oh, bullshit, like they run everything or whatever. Like I, it, there's, I, I can name you like half a dozen like fraternal organizations that have way more clout than is now than the Freemasons in America. Like the Masons are actually viewed as kind of like lower bougie, kind of trashy stuff here by a lot of people. Okay, They are. I'm just telling you what I'm not saying. I think that I'm telling you, that's the way like a lot of fucking people look at it, especially like social register types back when they had clout in Europe is a totally different story. The, uh, the Freemasons were viewed by, uh, by, um, by the third Reich as like Rosicrucian types. You know, they're like these fifth columnists who are, you know, they're degenerate. They're, they're, they're neither loyal to race, nor king, nor country, nor kin. You know, they're, 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 you know, they're, they're basically, uh, they're basically like a bourgeois fraternal society that's intrinsically subversive, you know, and that is, um, you know, uh, the, the, these, these people, the, these people can't be relied upon because their only loyalty is to, is this kind of like odd set of beliefs, which in reality often is nothing deeper than um, kind of cover for, uh, you know, ambush, ambitious social climbers to pretend as if there's, you know, some kind of deeper ethos to their, you know, to their covetousness um, of station and things. Okay. In terms of the Russians, I don't have a good understanding of Russian culture at all. Um, I don't read or speak Russian. I, uh, I think I've got a good understanding of their political heritage and how their decision-making process in war and peace terms plays out. But I, I cannot tell you like what the Russian take is on Freemasonry or like why the Ivans like viewed them as insidious, like why, why, why the Germans viewed them that way. Um, and this preceded like the, you know, the, the national Socialist revolution, but why, why the, why the third Reich in particular, like viewed them as like a, a, an undesirable element. Like that's why, um, there was a dedicated um uh there's there's a dedicated police uh um creepo um department or directorate uh dedicated to like spying on freemasons and like i think in some capacity like it endured after the war like if memory serves like when uh when um when the West German, when the Bundes Republic, like national police were restructured. And like, that's when like GSG nine became this like badass special ops force. Like, I, I think I remember reading something like they were still like spying on Freemasons and fucking with them. And they made a bunch of people mad. Like, Oh, this is like, you know, Nazis use a redux. Like, how dare you? Like, uh, but yeah, I don't, I don't have any insight in that, man. Like you'd have to talk to the, the Russian fellas in our circles or, or some of the European guys. Um, Oh, where was the other, oh, one of the other questions was, um, can you give your opinion of Yuri Bezmenov? Uh, I don't, I don't really have one. Cause I haven't, I haven't like read enough of his stuff. Like what, what, uh, like what specifically, like his take on Perestroika and Glasnost or like well, his character or what? It's like that, I honestly am not, what's it? Uh, there's a famous video in 1982, 83, where he, He's talking about how um, it, it was the Soviets who subverted the uh, subverted the um, yep the, the institutions and everything. That basically everything. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. He's one of those guys who he the he the guys who yeah the, the perestroika deception like the guys the same guys who were into that like cite him a lot. I don't. The Soviet Union was basically what it appeared to be, man. From uh, uh from especially from Brezhnev onward, like Khrushchev was kind of a wild card in like policy terms. I don't mean like in ideological terms, but it, I mean, like the, the subversion, such that it was coming from Moscow, it, uh, it in, in the, in the, in the, when the labor movement was, uh, was truly a national phenomenon with, with political cloud and manufacturing economy, you know, terrestrial manufacturing, like national economics was the order of the day, you know, um, really until, uh, until 1960 there about, yeah, you better believe that, uh, you better believe the common term and later common form, they were, they were totally insinuated into that, you know, and there was major unions that were shot through with like Soviet influence. Okay. Kind of the last gasp at was like the Welsh minor strike. 
the so like the Kremlin was pouring a bunch of money into those efforts. Okay, but that's the reason why. And again, I I I, I view it as a very imperfect signifier for all kinds of reasons. But I understand why people invoke cultural Marxism. Traditional Marxist Leninism does not emphasize culture. Everything is superstructure. It's all labor. It's all production. It's all capital. You know, it's all it's all how people's conceptual horizons and social behavior and um and 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 class and caste structuring like derives from labor and production schema. You know, so like if you asked. Like even the most radical kind of Mar like traditional Marxist Leninist in 1950, if you like asked him about stuff like homosexuality or like feminism or, or like about race relations, he just like tell you like none of that is important. Like these are bourgeois fixations or concerns, and you know only the alienation of of the of you know not just the not just the exploited proletariat, but you know the people who profit from it. You know they exist also in debased circumstances and. You know, not not being not being invested in actual like you know power processes of production as humans need to be you know to live you know psychologically healthy lives. You know they're they're drawing upon you know these these kind of superstructural meaningless like ephemera like that surrounds like human life. These are these things don't matter. Like that's literally what their take would be. Like they'd have no they they have no interest they they either have no interest in these kinds of culture conflict, um aspects that we are so familiar with or they'd say you know that's just not important you know okay maybe it's interesting maybe it's useful maybe it can be exploited to some discrete purpose but it's just not important you know that's that's the key difference so when these bircher types would talk into the 80s about how like everything bad that happens is coming from moscow i mean that was like a fucked up perspective for all kinds of reasons and it, it's just like uh, I mean, not not sensible and pragmatic reasons and obvious ones, but that's also just like not that's just not what like Sovietism was about. You know, it just wasn't. Talk a little bit about um, talk a little more about Latin America and how um, why was the Marxism of Moscow? Why was um, the way Moscow ran things, ran, ran things so attractive to so many in Latin America. I mean, because the whole Marxist Leninist, uh, particularly Leninist, you read Lenin's um, imperialism, the process that he describes, like in today's terms, um, that the legacy of Marxism is, is global systems theory, um, you know, like Emmanuel Wallerstein kind of stuff. Okay, um, even after Marxist-Leninism kind of like lost its animating power and kind of context in, in much of the world, it's still, and especially kind of some of its successor iterations, captured sort of the the fascination of, of Latin Americans because it, it, it very much was contextual there. Okay, like Latin America was and is kind of this hyper-exploited um primitive economic backwater you know that's like resource rich in terms of things like agricultural commodities um and not really owing to any kind of conspiracy but owing definitely to kind of structural design it remains mired in this kind of primitiveness you know owing to the kind of odd racial dynamics there's like this incredibly sharp caste distinction you know like there's a uh, like pretty much every kind of cliche that uh you know, from the Leninist, specifically the Leninist kind of playbook of history that's described, uh, that describes capitalism in punitive terms, you know, is like very, is like plainly evident in Latin America. Okay. And again, not, not for conspiratorial reasons, but for, you know, the peculiar and kind of somewhat tragic heritage of the region. <laughs> that's why it's, um, and it's interesting you raise that, um, I was reading the the Wilson Center, which I, I think is kind of abominable in a lot of ways, but <laughs> their archives are very useful and very interesting. Um, when Bush and Scowcroft, Bush 41, obviously, and Baker and Helmut Kohl, you know, were negotiating with, with Gorbachev, particularly as regarded, specifically as regarded to what, you know, the START Treaty, but generally, um, you know, the kind of exigencies related to ending the cold war something that cole and bush 
and Skullcroft all said to Gorbachev, I was like, look, like, however we leave this, you know, assuming that, you know, we can come to terms on, on nuclear weapons, assuming we can come to terms on, you know, a basically complete drawdown on forces and being in Europe. You know, he's like, we need your guarantee that your satellites in Latin America are going to stop exporting revolution. You know, and obviously they couch this in like the language of diplomacy and in the language of, 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 of American propaganda, you know, like subverting the democracies in, in Latin America. But this is very much on their mind, which is fascinating. And this makes sense. But that's that's why. And but there's also I mean, like Latin peoples are they're uh, they're uh, they're they're political romantics, man. You know, I'm not saying that like to make fun of them or in, in a negative way, like quite the contrary. It's like it makes them like effective partisans, you know. So you're gonna you're gonna be able to get you're gonna be able to get a bunch of Cubanos or a bunch of Argentines or a bunch of Salvadorians. You're gonna be able to get them to kind of export the revolution in a way that you wouldn't a bunch of North Koreans. Okay, I mean, let's be honest. I mean, it's like all those things. It's like historical. It's anthropological. It's 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 cultural. It's dare I say racial. I mean, that's why. Um. Well. You had mentioned before we started uh, going live that there were a couple things you might want to comment on yourself. Is there anything you uh, you wanted to get out I there? Just, I just, yeah, one of the, I want to, and we'll, we, we'll deal with this more in a dedicated capacity um, in, in a more current events discussion. But I, the degree to which the uh, what people like Bush, forty one, Scowcroft, Baker. Nixon himself, and I mean, make a mistake, like Nixon played a key role in ending the Cold War. Like the vision that they had for world order, um, obviously, you know, I don't agree with that vision, but there was something noble about it and something both pragmatic and uh, and developed about it. Um, the degree to which this was just utterly sabotaged, deliberately thrown in the trash so that, uh, you know, we could have... Um, you know, we could have this kind of free for all um, uh, in, in these criminal states like Ukraine, and they can be turned against Russia as, as these kind of like suicide torpedoes, you know, with the ultimate purpose in mind of, you know, ultimately deteriorating Russia's ability to defend itself from such attacks to the point that, you know, it, it Russia can be stripped of its nat natural wealth and looted. I mean, that's incredibly grotesque, man. Like everything, everything about how what developed subsequent um, to the, you know, the Bush Baker regime is just grotesque. That's the only word for it. And it really is. It's, 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 it, it literally is criminal, you know, and that should, that's why I get so offended when these idiots like wave these like Ukrainian flags, like, like what they're cheering on, like you're, 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 you're cheering on destruction and mass homicide literally for no reason, you know, for the profit of a handful of incredibly evil people. You know, like this, the fact that anybody can look at that as like some good thing or that that's like preferable to like what was accomplished in uh, 1990, it's just unconscionable. OK, I and mean, I realize it's a part of ignorance because these people don't know anything, but it's it, that doesn't make it any less disgusting. Um, you know, and I I behoove people. I want to do a, a dedicated Gulf War episode because that that's a that's a natural kind of like bookend to the Cold War. Um, not just like in linear terms, but like in conceptual ones. And that I want people to understand why I defend Bush 41 a lot. I don't want to defend Bush 41 because I like I like these fucking Yale assholes or because like I have something in common with social register types. I get tired of that, too. Like, I, I don't like when people call me like a quote wasp. It's like, look at me. Like, don't be fucking basic. Do I look like a wasp to you? Like, you know, if I wanted to be a wasp, which I don't like, I would never, ever be allowed like in their environs. OK, like the fact, uh, you know, yeah, there is like some sort of like tribal commonality between people like me and the Bushes. But it's well, like I mean, I'm going to I'm not, I'm not going to I'm not going to out you right now. But your last name is like Norman Dynasty. <laughs> no, I mean, that's true. Like, uh, <laughs> but I I've got some people in my lineage who are like incredibly like prestigious, but are also like unbelievably fucking trashy. <laughs> Dude, you know, okay. same 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 <laughs> but like my point is like if i showed up at if i showed up at kinds of places that like the bushes hang around like even if i was like flush of money like i'd be like showing the door like even if i was like even if i was even if i wasn't you know like 
you know, even if I like got a haircut and was like behaving myself, I guess that's kind of my point. But aside from all of that, like, um, you know, we, we, we don't need to agree with, you know, the kind of conceptual perspective of like Nixon or Bush 41, but these guys were motivated by good intentions, you know, at least as much as intentions can be good, like in power political matters. Um, I mean, even if they weren't, I mean, even like, let's say, let's play devil's advocate and say, oh, there was nothing good about this in like moral terms, but it was, it was incredibly ambitious and it was, you know, it, it was world transforming in a way that is laudable. And on, for, you know, the, the, uh, the kind of impactfulness of things like that, I think is, is, it represents like a good and its own terms. And the, uh, the fact that that was immediately succeeded by these like, you know, by by these conceptual illiterates and, and and just you know like like literal like bandits, you know, just like just just like bandits, mafiosi, like you know, just kind of like the lowest of the low, like uh, like kind of human carrion animals, um, eaters of the dead, literally. I mean that that's unconscionable, and that's um, and also it it also I mean it forces a question as to what you know what what I mean. You know, people people fought and died waging the Cold War. I'm not talking. I'm not talking about these fools in Washington. I mean, like regular guys. You know, and this was this was this was in the time when you got you got a draft card and you got forced to do it. You know, what we didn't have like this like dickhead police department for an army. You know, like it was, um, you know, like what basically like all the sacrifices that those guys made. You know, uh, and they were they were a bunch of white Christian guys mostly. Uh, that was essentially like completely fucking neutralized among everything else by this, by this kind of like, you know, uh, Semitic crusade against, you know, Byzantium. But yeah, no, that's all. Yeah. This was really great, man. I, I hope we got, everybody. We, we got one, we, we got a late, uh, que- we got a late no, question least, yeah. if you're okay with that. Yeah. It's uh fr- from William S over on uh, entropy. Yeah. Would NATO, would NATO have been able to hold West Germany in a seven days to the Rhine scenario? No, I don't think so. Um, no, definitely not. And that's what that was. Well, that raises an interesting point. I, I gamed that scenario like many, many times um, with a couple with with a couple different game platforms that I think are are basically the the variables are the variables they chose to code and the way they coded them are basically accurate. No, the only thing that 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 was William Odom's. Uh, a big concern because uh the only thing that would have stopped that onslaught is uh is theater nuclear weapons okay um and um to hold uh if to, to hold uh to hold warsaw pact armor in say 1985 in the north german plain and the fold of gap you know if you're gonna you're gonna start um you're, you're, you you had to start hitting them with grunge and, and Pershing twos. Okay. Um, and what would the Soviets do? You know, uh, would they like, would they escalate? I mean, um, to counter value assault? I mean, I don't know, but even if they didn't, it's like, okay, well now, now the Bundes Republic is, is a nuclear battlefield. You know, I mean, that's, and that's somewhat pure, but I don't, um, no, I don't think, uh, I don't think, um, no, I, they, the, Warsaw Pact would have uh, Warsaw Pact would have reached uh, would would have reached the Rhine in five to seven days, and uh, and and nothing could have stopped them. The um, the idea was um, NATO war planning was like late in the game. I'm talking like kind of the final iteration of uh, of um, of NATO war gaming was that uh, the uh, American uh. The British and uh, and Benelux uh, tankers, like the British and the Benelux guys, they were responsible for the North German plane, like American uh, and like a and like black horses at the full gap, basically. Um, they the idea was that if they could hold Warsaw Pact for seventy two hours, um, NATO could be rapidly reinforced, um, and, and uh, uh, presumably like stage. Uh, you know, a counteroffensive that, uh, you know, under best of circumstances uh, would have been able to hold uh, the enemy at the north, at the inner German border. But um, 
if the fans are in question. I highly recommend Russell Stofley's uh stuff on uh on NATO. Um and he he gamed a lot of this stuff with a bunch of former Wehrmacht officers. It's really freaking cool. But yeah, that's a great question, man. I mean, I, I love that kind of stuff. Yeah, Robert in the comments says seven days they would have been in Rotterdam and Antwerp. <laughs> no, hundred percent. They they would they would have been chilling on the Riviera, like like whistling at girls. <laughs> All right, man. Um, do your plugs and we'll end this. I, we really appreciate, I know everyone appreciate this. We got 126 people watching oh, wow. on a, on a last minute unannounced stream. So. No, freaking awesome, man. No, I, I, yeah, again, sorry, man. Like I was feeling crummy since I got, I feel a lot better now. I was feeling crummy since I got back from Lynchburg and um, I should have announced like check with you if you want to do this sooner but i i i'm stoked that i'm stoked that people were, were happy with this kind of change in format it seemed appropriate but um you can find me on substack at real thomas 777.substack.com probably most of the people who tune in regularly know that um the channel is on track um i uh I, i've been apologizing for being kind of a nerd lately because i've been I've, I've needed time to get back to people because i was feeling really shitty but every like we're we're on track for like production and stuff. And um a bunch of um a bunch of people have been donating to like help expedite the process, like which is awesome. And I mean, like I said, I include the caveat, like if we raise zero dollars, that is totally fine. Like no nobody should feel obligated to, you know, to um to to, to donate, you know, a hard earned cash just for the sake of like expediting like content production. Like there's something's important in this world that we do. There's something's not so important. <laughs> like our content is not one of those more important things, but like a bunch of people have donated and that is that that's like incredible, man. And that like, that this is dope, but don't anyone ever feel obligated, man. Like hundred percent. Like I'm not just being like gracious, but um, we're still on Burb app. I'm going to disengage as the summer goes on. Um, but right now that's where I drop a lot of stuff. Just kind of like housekeeping stuff as well as like you know notifying people we're doing it's real all caps r-e-a-l underscore number seven h-o-m-a-s seven 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 i'm still on tgram i'm gonna up my tgram game and get more active there especially as i kind of like slide back from burbap i'm on instagram i'm on tiktok and i know tiktok is like fucking retarded but um like a lady friend of mine like uh she uh she had the idea that like I can make some funny TikTok videos and I'm going to start like experimenting with that some, um, and see how long it takes them to like nuke me for like, you know, any number of things. But, uh, but yeah, that's where we're at right now, man. And, um, you know, and on June 9th, uh, unlike some fucking people who will go unnamed, who like organize like really gay events where gay things go on and they like charge people like fucking half a stack to like go hear about gay stuff. I, like once a year or so, like I, just, I see if people like convene in Chi Town to hang out. And like last year, we went to see Kraftwerk and it was fucking awesome. Like this year, we're going to go see the Murder Junkies at Reggie's in the, in the South Loop. If you can like scrounge up like $15 and get here, like you can go. Um, it's like 15 bucks at the door. But uh, a lot of people are are excited about that from what I'm gleaning from the feedback. So that's June 9th. So if you want to go, like, save the date. And like I said, last year we had a lot of fun, man. And we'll, we'll like, hang out and stuff, too, like, before and after the show. Um, but that, yeah, that's that's all I got, man, for my plugs. All right, man. Um, I'm going to stop the recording now and then uh, YouTube afterwards. So uh, thanks a lot. Until the next time. Yeah, thank you, man. All right, I want to thank everyone on YouTube who showed up to uh, at the last minute. I mean, this was... Uh, more than we expected at the last minute and uh thank you for the the couple people who dropped uh dropped super chats i really appreciate that especially since uh youtube is basically taking away all my monetization and everything so no that's um, that's uh yeah they're they're freaking vultures man but no this this was great man again thanks um thanks for um abiding the the kind of change in format yeah and just like i said a lot of people i mean not just lately but like since we started um the series they they wanted like a, a q a kind of format so i figured that it would this would be like a good time for it so yeah this was this was great man we can uh, uh hold on hold on i'm going to disconnect from the YouTube ball rolling right now. i know you want to start or I'm, oh yeah i'm yeah. going to disconnect 